All right. Good to see you today. How's everybody doing? Can we give the Lord some praise? Wasn't worship awesome this morning? Come on. God is so good. Hey, I appreciate you um, being here today. My name is Nate. I'm the campus pastor at the North Campus, and uh, just really blessed to have the opportunity to hang out with you today. Um, we, I have so many memories from being here and being a part of this, this particular campus for a long time. I was the youth pastor, literally in this room, for uh, many, many years. I proposed to my wife here at this campus. In fact, it was in the, some of you who have been around for a long time might remember the old worship center when it had like the red carpet and the red pews and the woods, you know, all that. Well, I proposed to my wife there then and um, Pastor Matt was playing like Purple Rain on the, on the grand piano that used to be in there. It was awesome. But um, anyways, uh, so I have a lot of memories from here. So I just, from the bottom of my heart, I say thank you for allowing me the opportunity to share. Um, I really feel like the, the Lord has something good for you today. And so I'm looking forward to sharing that. But Um, With that said, you guys ready for the word today? If you're ready, say I'm ready. Let's pray and we'll jump in. Lord, I thank you for today. Thank you for your goodness in our lives. Jesus, you are so, so good. We uh, just just honor you today. We invite you here. We invite you to move and speak. It's in your name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. Hey, I wanted to say something kind of to what Sharon said just a few minutes ago. She mentioned the salvations and the baptisms that happened. Well, in my own life at the North Campus, uh, we had some, some baptisms and decisions as well, including my son. So I actually have a video, just to give a little update of uh, what's happening. This is my seven-year-old Jojo getting baptized. Wait for it. All right. Oh, I love it. I love it. He's such a good little man. Uh, and there's a picture of him, too. All right. What a stud. <laughs> and I just, uh, I just show you that today because I just want to say before we get into the message, this is such a, a good church, and you are part of a great church family. And I want you to know, even beyond what you see here at the Blue Angel Campus each week, God is just on the move and across our campuses through so many people in so many lives. People changing because of Jesus is not a billboard. It is who we are, it is what we do, and, and so thank you to all of you. And gosh, I mean, can you imagine the future is bright, 10 more campuses to come, thousands more people to reach, and thousands more lives to change, and that is because of this church family that is just all about Jesus and doing an incredible work. So uh, I, I say all that to boast in the Lord, right? So can we just give God some praise for what he's doing? Even in this crazy season, even in this COVID Rona season, it's just amazing what God is up to through our church family. So uh, with that said, we're gonna continue on with our series today, Foxes in the Vineyard. And today, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna keep on moving with that. But I wanna start with this. Um, a, a, a couple weeks ago, my wife and I, uh, as we were getting ready for the series, we decided to do one of those personality tests to kind of see how we matched up. And there's lots of these things, like there's the DISC assessment. Has anybody done the DISC assessment? I know we used to do that here. Um, There's the the Strength Finder one. Does anybody know what I'm talking about with that? There's the Strength Finder. And then, but the one we did a couple weeks ago was the Myers-Briggs test. And you'll never guess what we discovered when we did this this assessment. Like what we found when we did that test is that like we are really, really different. Like, that was our big discovery. I know it's amazing to you, but we are totally opposite, right? I'm a ENTJ. She's an ISFG uh, or J or something like that. Uh, but we're just totally different. I'm the person that, like, moves off of intuition. She's the one that's like, I'm not making a choice until we have all of the facts. In fact, a couple weeks ago, we were getting ready for my daughter's uh, birthday. And my daughter, who I have a picture of Naomi as well, and... Um, Maybe, maybe not, um, but, we, but we're getting her for her birthday, and she wanted a pony for her birthday, right? Did we get it? Okay, nice. How do you say no to that? When she asks for a pony, like, what do you do? You get the girl a pony. At least that's my take on it. I was like, let's do it. Let's, get, let's rent a, a pony to come to our house and, and walk in circles for a while. And uh, of course, my wife goes, well, how much does it cost? And I'm like, well, what do you mean? Who cares how much it costs? It's my daughter. We love her. All this, you know? And she's like, well, that doesn't make sense. We don't have enough money. So we, you know, we kind of like went through this and, and our differences kind of caused us to have a little friction. And, uh, and I say that because, you know, we're different. We're different. Rachel and I are very different from each other. In, in 17 years of marriage, you think we would know that by now. 
but it just becomes more and more evident every day um, that as Psalms 139 says, my wife is wonderfully complex. I actually have a picture of us as well. This is from our wedding day. There you go. And then I have a picture of what I look like every time I see her. There you go, come on. <laughs> as, look, as beautiful as she is, like, like, we are so different from one another. Even like going to get coffee uh, at the drive-thru, we're so different. We'll go to Starbucks and, and the lady will ask us what we want. And, and, and for me, you know, I'm just like, I just want coffee. Just give me a coffee. And Rachel will be like, what flavor? You gotta tell them what flavor. I'm like, I want coffee flavor, coffee. And they'll ask her what she wants, and she's like, you know, I would like a half-calf coconut milk latte with whip, extra shot of espresso, hot with a scoop of ice, two sleeves, no cup. You know what I mean? I'm like, whoa, I don't even know what that is. How does that even work? But we're so different. Like, even how we approach that is different. Even how we go to sleep at night is different. You know, Rachel, she's got this routine of decompressing and getting ready to go to sleep. She's got to read a good book and put lotion on her feet, and then she gets dressed for bed. Like, why do you get dressed for bed? I just kind of, whoop, just jump in, fall asleep. Sometimes I don't even make it to bed before I fall asleep, which kind of causes some other, uh, other tension. But we're just different. Like, she's very serious, very studious, um, very driven. And for me, I'm the person that probably needs to take life a little more seriously. She's the one that's responsible when she's making dinner for our family to make something that's very healthy. If I'm responsible to get dinner any particular night, what I'll cook for dinner is Papa John's. Come on, is anybody else with me on that? Like, that's what I do. And, and like I said, we're just, we're just very, very different. And I, and I just point out our differences to say the same is probably true with many of you in your relationships, especially in these love relationships. We are very, very different from one another. And I want you to see today that that's actually a really good thing. See, it's our differences, it's these differences, that, that, that's why we need one another. It's our differences that attract us to one another, right? It's, it's our differences, like we're, we're different intellectually, physically, emotionally, we're so different and we're like puzzle pieces that God brings together and that's, those differences are what make us compatible. But those differences, that's also the problem, isn't it? Right? We're very different. And we're, we're very unique, and those uniquenesses bring us together, but we're also different. And, and those differences often, if we're not careful, we can let them tear us apart. There's a, there's a scene that this whole series is built on. It's in uh, Song of Songs, chapter two. And if you've, if you've followed along, I think Pastor Matt mentioned this last week, but it's this beautiful picture of this, of this couple and they're in love and they're talking to one another. They're wooing each other with their words and she's talking to him and he's talking to her and, and she's saying what she loves about him and he's saying what he loves about her. And it's this beautiful scene, but there's this point in this scene where it just sort of stops and the, and the guy says to her, he says, he says, and this is so good. Let us be so careful not to let anything mess this up. And that's where we get this verse that this series is built on, Song of Songs 215, where he says to her, he says, let us catch the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, our vineyards that are in bloom. Now, how many of you know that it's the little things that mess us up? It's the little things, the little struggles, the, the little foxes that add up to big trouble in our relationships. That's why this phrase is kind of the crux of this whole thing, that struggles that aren't addressed become strongholds that we cannot ignore. And today I wanna talk to you about one of those difficulties, one of those strongholds, one of those things we struggle with. I wanna talk to you about what I believe is the most difficult to talk about part of all of the relationship equation. I wanna to talk to you about the part of the relationships, uh, of your relationship that you don't want me to talk about. Do you know what it is? It's you. It's you. You know, it's easy to point the finger at all the other things. If that was a better circumstance, if that was right, if they would get it together, if they would figure it out, then we would be better. But the thing nobody wants to talk about when we talk about relationships is this right here, right? Nobody wants to look in the mirror and say, what needs to change right here? That's why today I wanna to talk about you. So if you're married and you're thinking, you know, will they ever change, well, that's next week. Make sure you're here. It's gonna be really important. 
If you're here today and you're single and it's in your heart to find somebody and you're thinking, what do I need to do to find the right person? I don't know if anybody has searched shippedoff.com to see what that website actually is. <laughs> don't search that right now, as I have no idea. Um, but if you're single and you're, and you're thinking, what do I need to do to, to find that right person? Well, step one in any relationship, any kind of relationship, friendship, marriage, family, you name it, step one is to ask this question. What needs to change right here? You know, it's really easy in any relationship, whether, whether now or to come, to expect way more out of someone else than you expect out of yourself, which is why this is the most important question in relationships. This is the most important question you can ask in relationships. Are you becoming the person that you're expecting them to be? This is step one. You want, you want healing in, in your marriage? You want healing in your relationships? You want to be who you need to be for that relationship? Here's the deal. You want revival? You want God to fill up your home, draw a circle around you, and say, what needs to change right here? What needs to change in me? What needs to change in you? What needs to change in you? Now, check this out. To, to kind of walk through this today, I want to deal with four particular areas that I really believe if we, will, if we will allow ourselves to get healthy in these four areas, then we will become who we need to be for the relationships we want, that we desire or the relationships that God has given us. If we will get healthy in these four areas, then we'll be healthy humans for the relationships that God has brought us into. How many of y'all know that healthy relationships are built on healthy people? Healthy relationships are the result of healthy people. So I wanna to talk to you about these four areas where I wanna challenge you to get healthy. And, and here's what I want you to do. And everybody, can, you can grab like a piece of paper out of the seat, take notes, please, something like that. Uh, but, but dig into this today. Uh, I always say note takers are difference makers. So like take notes, follow along, because here's what I want you to do. I want you to evaluate yourself in these four areas. And, and, and as I give you each of these areas, on a scale of one to 10, where do you stand? Right, where do you stand? Are, are you, uh, in, in a particular area, are you a one? Are you a five? If you feel like you're a 10, you're probably a two. You know what I'm saying? Like, like evaluate yourself in each of these areas and figure out where you stand because the only way to change is to realize you have a problem. So evaluate yourself and once you realize where you stand, then the next part of this is what do you need to do to close the gap between where you are and where God wants you to be for those relationships? So I'm gonna give you these four areas and this is what I want you to do. On a scale of one to 10, where do you stand? What do you need to do to change? And here's the first area I wanna challenge you with and that is your closeness to God. Closeness to God. The Bible says, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. So I wanna ask you to honestly consider today on a scale of one to 10, look in the mirror, how are you in regard to your closeness to God? What does that look like these days? What does your prayer life look like these days? And this is important because if, if, if you aren't honestly and personally seeking God, then none of the stuff we're gonna talk about is gonna matter, right? Because biblical principles on relationships don't carry any weight in your life if you don't know the God of those biblical principles. It's so important that we realize in order to be the healthy person, the healthy human being that I need to be for the relationships I keep, it starts with my closeness to God. I mean, think about this. Apart from, our, uh, apart from God, our greatest understanding in, in our culture, our greatest understanding of expressions of love are things like, you know, maybe when a young man takes a knee to propose to his girl, or, or maybe something like sex would be seen as a great expression of love in our world and in our culture. Uh, maybe something like a marriage ceremony, a wedding ceremony, might be considered a great expression of love in our world. But apart from God, like that's what we've got to look at and to view as great expressions of love. Here's the thing, if we include God in our life in drawing close to God, we actually define, uh, discover that there's a greater expression of love than anything that this world could offer. And it's this. It's the cross. This is love. This is what love looks like. 
1 John 3.16 says, this is how we know what love is. That Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. I love that it says, this is how we know what love is. By no other way, by no other expression of love, this is how we discover and know what love is. This is the greatest expression and our greatest revelation of what, tr- of what love truly means and also how we should love anyone else. But can I tell you, that revelation is only uncovered when our, when our hearts are brought near to his which is why this question is so important, which is why this kind of personal evaluation here is such a big deal. How is your closeness to God? On a scale of one to 10, where do you stand right there? Where do you stand? And then the, and the second part of that is what do you do to close the gap between where you are and who you're meant to be? That's one. Here's the second one, second area I wanna challenge you to evaluate. And that is to consider, on a scale of one to 10, how are you at your willingness to forgive? Willingness to forgive. Can I tell you, marriage or dating or any meaningful relationship is simply a crash course in how to forgive. Or it's merely a crash course. Depending on what you decide to do, with mercy. When we think about the expression of love that is the cross, and we think about what it means, the, the, the cross is our greatest example of what? Of mercy, of the mercy of God poured out, forgiveness given to us, even though we didn't deserve it. That's what the cross is. And that's why it's so important that if we received mercy from God, that we give mercy to others. One of the core verses that's a part of this series is Ephesians 4, 27 that says, don't let the sun go down while you're angry and do not give the devil a foothold. In other words, you know how to give the devil a foothold? Refuse to forgive. Lie down bitter and angry. If you wanna give the devil a foothold in your relationship, if you wanna let the little foxes run wild and tear apart your relationship, give the devil a foothold. Refuse to forgive. It's such, this is such a big deal. It's so important that we realize and recognize within ourselves when we're withholding mercy. Right? This is a, it's a huge area of hypocrisy in a lot of Christians that we resent the people we love for making the same mistakes that we ourselves have made. Besides that, if... if think about this. If you require the people in your life to be perfect, then you force them to live in hiding. You force them to live in shame. You force them to live in fear of you. This is such a huge area where we must become healthy for the sake of the health of the people we love. So on a scale of one to 10, where do you stand? Where do you stand? And what do you need to do to close the gap between who you are and who God made you to be in the area of forgiveness? Closest to God, willingness to forgive. Here's the third one. Selflessness to serve. On a scale of one to 10, how well do you do at selflessness to serve? Can I tell you, in 17 years of marriage, my wife and I have fought about everything everything. Whatever you just thought of right now, yep, we did. We fought over that, right? We fought over who's going to get up at two in the morning to let the dog out. We fought over who's going to get up at four in the morning to change a diaper. We fought over who's going to uh, wash the dishes. We fought over who's going to drive home. In fact, one of my, uh, one story we have of one of our biggest fights we ever had, we were at small groups at church right over here. And, um, and after we left our small group, we walked outside Pretending everything's okay, we went to our car, and she was like, who's gonna drive? I was like, well, I'm gonna drive, I'm a man, you know? And she was like, you're an idiot, and I'm gonna, you know, so, and we got into it, and can I tell you, that night I walked from Perdido Key halfway to Cantonment, because I was being a jerk. (laughs) I mean, we fought over everything, but can I tell you, in 17 and a half years of marriage, we have learned the most important secret to overcoming selfishness 
In 17 and a half years of marriage, this is the most important lesson we've learned. And it's this. Now, listen, when the pastor says, this is the most important lesson I've ever learned in having a healthy marriage, you write this down, you hear me? It's the most important lesson I've, I've ever learned, though. And I really mean that. When, when I die to myself, I breathe life into my marriage. When I die to myself, I breathe life into my relationships. The love language above all love languages is this, die to self. Die to self. We are in these relationships to help one another, to be there for one another, to stand with one another in times of need. That's why we have these relationships. But the only way that we can be there for one another is that we serve one another. So how well are you doing in the area of serving? Of serving? And, and here's an important point, because you know a lot of times, and, and I've done a lot of marriage counseling, and a lot of times in these relationships, it seems like there's like one person is like the dominant person, and one person is like the helper person, you know what I mean? One person is the, like kind of dominates the relationship, and the other person kind of takes the role of the assistant in, in the relationship. And I'm just gonna let you know, because we've, we've talked through this a lot, it, it goes both ways. It can be either person in that relationship. And I wanna challenge you because a lot of times people will take certain verses from the Bible and say, well, that's the way it's supposed to be. And I'm just gonna let you know that that is not a true statement. Right, that we are supposed to be co-partners and helpers of one another and servants of one another within this relationship in order for it to be the way God designed for it to be. And I wanna show you that real quick. See, in Genesis 2.18, this is one of those verses that's kind of twisted out of context. It says, and the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone, right? But I will make him a helper comparable to him. That word there, helper, it's, it's twisted out of context. It's taken a lot of different ways. And, um, and I wanna show you something here. That word helper, it's actually the, the Hebrew word, azur. Azur. And it means to help. It means to come alongside the greatest picture of it is probably this, that it means to help up. What's interesting about this word, azir, is that you know where it's most prominently used? Not to define our relationship with our spouse, but in regards to our relationship with God. In fact, 20 times in the Old Testament, the word azir is used to describe God. Let me show you one example. Psalm 33, 20, it says, our soul waits for the Lord. He is our azure, our help, and our shield. Now let's just theologize for a second. Are you designed to serve God or is God designed to serve you? Does this word azure in regards to God mean he's supposed to help you and do everything for you and, 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 and clean up after you and all that stuff? No way. No way. And it doesn't mean that in your relationship either. This word, helper, it means that in, in this relationship there's a mutuality of serving one another. We're in this together. We work together. And if you're falling down, I'm helping you up. I'm lifting you up. Whoever it is, if one of us is having an off day, the other one's coming along to lift you up, to help you. That's what it means. It's so important that we understand that this is about mutually serving one another and caring for one another. And can I tell you, in my, relationships with my, in my relationship with my wife, in any relationship I've ever been in, friendships, family, whatever, you name it, when, I, when there's tension in the relationship and I take steps to act selflessly towards that person, it brings life into our relationship, right? Anybody here besides me ever been in, in, in a place with your spouse or your loved one where you're like, there's so much tension in the room, you can't look each other in the eyes. Like, you're, you're ready, you're like, let's go! How do you deal with that? How do you diffuse that? Can I challenge you today? If it's me, I'm just gonna say, I probably would try to first think of a funny joke, which I'm not funny, so it doesn't work. But what I've learned in 17 years of marriage, the way to break the tension is to serve one another, right? So how are you doing in the area of service? Do you serve one another? 
Do you serve her? Do you serve him? Are you willing to take a knee and let them have the win? On a scale of one to 10, are you willing to serve? And wherever you find yourself, what are you gonna do to close the gap between where you are and who God wants you to be? Can I say this? And I didn't say this in the last service. Think about Jesus as a servant in scripture. Think about when Jesus washed the disciples' feet. I don't know if you've ever thought about this before. Jesus washed Judas' feet. If anybody had a reason to not wash their, their, their friend's feet, it was him in that moment. But he was so willing to serve that he would wash his enemy's feet. And it is the truth of how to break through in your relationships as well. All right, number four, number four. Um, I wanna ask you to evaluate yourself on a scale of one to 10 in this last area, <clears throat> and it's this, wisdom to see what you have. Wisdom to see what you have. The Bible says without vision, we perish, and can I tell you that's true of your relationships as well. If you don't have vision for, for the relationship God has given you, it will perish. It will, it will break, it will, it will be wounded, it will hurt. Proverbs 29, 18 says, if people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. Are you attending to what God has revealed to you? Because I know, because I've done a lot of weddings in my day, that, that most of you, you came forward at some point, all these married couples, you came forward, you walked up to, to, maybe it was at Las Vegas, I don't know, but you came up to the altar and you said your vows, you looked each other in the eyes, and you said, this is the one that God has brought to me. This is the person that God has put in my life and so often we, get, we, we come forward, we have these ceremonies, we, we give ourselves away to one another, and then we cross that wedding line and we say, well, that's done, I'm done with that, now, I can, now we can move on and attend to other things. No way! This is the one that God has put in your life to attend to. Attend to what he has revealed to you. You have vision for your job. You have vision for your future. You have vision for things you want to do in life. Do you have vision for your marriage? Do you have vision for your family? Are you having the wisdom to attend to what God has revealed to you? Just show of hands. Who here would like to have a relationship that God calls blessed? then are you attending to what he's revealed to you? Do you have the wisdom to see what God has given you? But also, do you have the wisdom not to look at what God has not given you? Do you have the wisdom not to pursue what God has not given you? Often we look across the way, we see somebody else, we meet, we meet people along the way and we think, man, the grass is a lot greener over there. Can I tell you what that truly reveals to you? When the grass is greener over there, it only reveals that, that you need to water the grass right here. That you need to answer the question, what needs to change right here? Right, and I'm just trying to challenge you today. today. If you wanna have revival in your relationships, it starts here. If you wanna have relationships that are healed and restored and brought to life, if you wanna have rela the relationship maybe someday down the road that is the relationship you hope to have, well, it doesn't start out there somewhere. It doesn't start when every circumstance becomes right. No, it starts when you look in the mirror and decide what needs to change in you. Because healthy relationships are made from healthy people. And that starts with you. So what needs to change with you? What needs to change with you? And see, all this matters today because the most difficult fox to catch is the one in the mirror. And all I'm asking today is if you will do the part of this work that only you can do, and that is to answer the question, what needs to change in me? What needs to change in you? 
I'm gonna close with this today. I've got uh, two things here. I've got a mask and I have a mirror. Mask and the mirror. And you have a choice to make. Which one will you choose? In your relationships, will you put on the mask and play the game and pretend you're something you're not or pretend you're okay when you're really not? Will you put on the mask and, and play the game, you know, where you get to church and you're fighting all the way to church and you get out of the car and you put on the mask and smile and go, hey, welcome to Liberty, we're so glad. Will you put on the mask and play the game and pretend everything's all right when you know that you need a little bit of help? Will you put on the mask or will you take up a mirror and look inside and dig deep, consider who God has called you and designed you to be and choose to change? Anybody like going to the gym? Okay, a couple people. I hate going to the gym. I'm just gonna be honest with you. Can I? I hate it. You know why I hate it? Because there's mirrors around the whole thing. And you know what the mirrors around the whole gym tell you? The truth. They tell me that this body ain't made out of broccoli. You know what I mean? They tell us the truth. And there's like kind of this like emotional mirror we've got to hold up. It's called the Bible. It's called the Holy Spirit. There's this, there's this spiritual mirror that we hold up and, and, and it shows us the truth of who we are and it shows us what needs to change right here and it challenges us and it steps on our toes and it says take off the mask and quit playing games and step into the reality of who God has called you to be, even in your marriage, even in your relationships. I'm just asking, which one are you gonna choose? Are you going to keep playing the game? Or will you today take up the mirror? These four areas of life, will you evaluate where you are and answer the question, what needs to change right here? Healthy relationships are made out of healthy people. So will you draw close to God? Will you be faithful in mercy? Will you be sacrificial in serving? And will you honor what God has given you? Will you answer this question? In these areas, what needs to change in me? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity just to come into your house and, and dig into your word and, and have a conversation with friends about, about the truth. Jesus, you are so faithful. You love us so much and you refuse to leave us where you found us. That's what the cross is about. You died for our sins. You came and you met us in our muck and our mire when we look at who we are and we see like, man, I, I, I've got to grow in this area. I'm not merciful. I'm not serving. I'm not doing these things. When we look in the mirror and see where we are and we see that we're not where we want to be, Jesus, we give you praise because you came to meet us in that place and to make a way to make us new to give us a fresh start and a new beginning and a new direction altogether. Jesus, we thank you for what you have done. So God, we choose today to take off the mask and let you work. Lord, I thank you that this church is a safe place for us to take off masks and leave them at the altar. I thank you that this is a safe place to evaluate what you're doing in our lives and choose to change. So in your name we pray. Everybody in the house said, amen. Hey, can we give the Lord some praise? Come on.